Good morning. Uh, my name is Christopher Lamont. I am the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor here at the State Department. Uh, I want to welcome everyone to the third Leahy Vetting Conference, uh, and uh, thanks to those joining us virtually. Uh, I can say, for my part, it certainly feels like a lot longer than three years uh, since uh, we last gathered as a community in 2019. Um, so it feels uh, special to be back together. Uh, let me say as well, I think it feels a especially uh, remarkable moment to have uh, with us today two of our nation's uh, most distinguished uh, leaders in foreign policy. Um, Senator Patrick Leahy uh, of Vermont uh, with us this morning. Senator, I know that this phrase is used often, but I feel confident in saying today that we, we literally wouldn't be here today but, but for you. Uh, we're, we're so pleased uh, to have you with us in person, in person today. Um, uh, before you deliver your keynote remarks, Senator, uh, we're also extremely fortunate to have with us Deputy Secretary Wendy Sherman uh, to open our conference this morning. Deputy Secretary Sherman, by my count, you have served in senior State Department leadership positions for three presidents and five secretaries of state. In between your work on nuclear disarmament, mm -hmm. for which President Obama awarded you the National Security Medal, and your exhausting travel schedule of diplomatic engagements with our allies, with our partners, and with our adversaries. Uh, you have been a steadfast champion throughout your career for human rights. You have stood up to abusive governments. You have stood with the advocates and activists on the front lines of these fights. Uh, so I want to say how lucky we are to have you with us today uh, and to open uh, this year's Leahy Conference. And with that, over to you. Thank you very much, Chris. And uh, thank you all so much for joining us uh, for the 2022 Leahy Law Conference. I have the very special, distinct pleasure and true honor of introducing the namesake and driving force behind this important law, the Dean of the Senate, the President pro tempore, and our dear, dear friend, Vermont Senator Patrick Leahy. I also want to extend a warm welcome to Senator Leahy's wife and partner in all things, Marcel. Thank you for joining us this morning. And also want to make note of Tim Reeser, that most of us over the years have known, who tells us what to do and when to do it. <laughs> uh, and we're very grateful for his service uh, to the country. From the beginning of this administration, President Biden and Secretary Blinken have vowed to put human rights back at the center of the United States foreign policy. And there's a very simple reason for that. When the United States stands up for universal human rights, for the rights of people everywhere to live with dignity, to worship according to their beliefs, to think what they will and to speak their minds without fear, to be equal in the eyes of the law, to love who they love and to live openly as who they are, it makes our country stronger. It helps safeguard our most important values for our children and grandchildren. It makes us more stable, prosperous, and secure. And it shows the world, especially those who violate the human rights of their own citizens or claim that there's no such thing as universal human rights at all, that the United States is committed to advancing and protecting human rights in our actions, not only in our words. That's what's at the heart of the law we are celebrating and discussing today. The Leahy Law is based on a simple idea. When the United States has credible evidence that foreign military or police units or individual actors have committed gross violations of human rights, we shouldn't provide foreign military assistance or training to those units. So-called Leahy vetting acts as both a carrot and a stick. Knowing that human rights abuses can cause units to lose out on support from the United States encourages a country's political, military, and security leadership to prevent those abuses from taking place. And if human rights violations do occur, we have a response ready to deploy and a tool to encourage leaders to seek accountability for those responsible. Leahy vetting works efficiently and effectively. Since the Invest C electronic vetting system was launched three years ago, 
It's been used by the State Department posts all over the world to vet more than 500,000 cases. Each year, the Department publishes a list of units from foreign security forces that are ineligible to receive U.S. assistance because of human rights violations uncovered through Leahy vetting, another important measure to help improve security. The Leahy Law helps the United States to live up to our highest values, to exercise conscience through our foreign policy, and that is what Senator Leahy's career has been all about. As a freshman senator who had won his first race by the skin of his teeth, he voted against extending funding for the Vietnam War. That was despite direct appeals from both the powerful chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee and the President of the United States. But Senator Leahy had told the people of Vermont that he opposed continuing that war. And senators, he believed, should keep their word. During the George H. W. Bush administration, Senator Leahy proposed a somewhat audacious idea to the President. Inspired both by a young boy he had met in Nicaragua who had lost a leg to a landmine, and by a veteran who'd been seriously wounded in Vietnam, he proposed the United States set up a fund to aid the innocent victims of unexploded ordnance, including by paying for prosthetics, wheelchairs, and other mobility devices. At the time, the United States and Vietnam didn't have diplomatic relations. We had no embassy or posts in the country. But Senator Leahy proposed to President Bush and Secretary Baker that the program start with Vietnam, and he suggested that an organization of veterans who had served in that conflict lead the charge. Today, the Leahy War Victims Fund provides up to $14 million per year in relief to those who have been injured by landmines or other unexploded ordnance left behind in the aftermath of conflict. Since the Leahy War Victims Fund was created, the United States has provided assistance devices and rehabilitation support to more than 250,000 people in 35 countries. It's another example of how Senator Leahy's vision married our actions to our ideals as a nation. And like the Leahy Law, the Leahy War Victims Fund will continue carrying that vision forward for many years to come. As you all know, Senator Leahy announced earlier this year that he is not seeking another term and will retire after nearly five decades of service on behalf of Vermont and the American people in the United States Senate. What you may not know is that Senator Leahy, among his many talents and interests, is an avid photographer. And for many years in his office in the Capitol, he had the same photograph framed above his desk, a portrait of a man he had met when visiting a refugee camp, who had told him simply, don't forget people like me. Senator Leahy calls it his conscience photo. It reminds him of why he got into public service in the first place, to speak on behalf of those who would not otherwise be heard, to act in hopes of making the country and the world a freer, fairer, and more prosperous place. Senator, thank you, my friend, for all you have done to serve as a voice of conscience in America's foreign policy. You have been a true friend and partner to all of us here at the Department of State, so much so that we're considering a pat signal to beam toward Vermont <laughs> when inevitably we will find ourselves hoping to call on your wisdom, your policy expertise, and yes, your conscience. Now, most of you probably know 
that Senator Leahy has had a cameo in five Batman movies. <laughs> he has a Batman insignia on the side of his wheelchair. And Batman famously said, a hero can be anyone. Pat Leahy is not just anyone, but he is a hero to every single one of us. Thank you, Senator. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Wendy and, and Chris. <clears throat> you know, you are, you are seeing all of the heroes here, the people have to work on, on this issue. And, <clears throat> and of course, Wendy and I have known each other for years and years. I should probably call <laughs> you by your title, but uh, yeah. we don't. We've known each other as Patrick and Wendy for a long time, and we've been in discussions with presidents and secretaries of state and, and others, which I've always, uh, always enjoyed. And I'll give you just a tiny bit more of the George H.W. Bush in supporting this wanted to take it to Vietnam. And I was down in the Oval Office with he and uh, James Baker. And <clears throat> the, I was describing what I wanted to do. They both thought it was a good idea. And I mentioned a government official who didn't think it was that good an idea. President Bush turned, I've never heard uh, Secretary Baker call this it, Jimmy. Get him on the phone. So he did, on the speaker phone. The three of us were sitting there in the Oval Office. He comes on, he starts talking about this, and the official said, oh, well, Mr. Secretary, you know, uh, Senator Leahy is down touting this thing all the time, but we don't think it's a good idea at this time with Vietnam, et cetera. And Baker said, okay, I understand, uh, but I got somebody here who thinks it is a good idea. <laughs> Mr. President, <laughs> <laughs> President Bush comes out here. They're quick, you turn. And we went there. And um, when I brought a bipartisan Codell, as I always do, and this kid we have the subject, but Tim Reeser, of course, knows the story so well. Uh, they spoke on a very hot day. We were dressed casually, but all of it in Vietnamese and go on that every so often I hear Patrick Leahy and uh, one very slight man, no legs, neatly dressed, was just sitting there staring at me and I thought how much he must hate me. And, and America, you know, he was somebody over six feet tall and everything else. And when they finish, they said, would you pick him up and put him in the chair? Unfortunately, Marcel was a nurse and she explained how to pick him up without hurting him. Probably weighed 60 pounds. So I went all the time, he was just staring at me. I, uh, I picked him up, put him in the wheelchair. I started to get back up, he grabbed my shirt, he pulled me down, and he kissed me. Mm. Same thing happened with John Glenn, who was on the uh, delegation. John. Rest of soul is not an emotional person, but he was that day. And I went back and told President Bush what had happened. He had tears in his eyes. He said, thank you. I thank the people who worked on it. It's like being here. Look at what we're doing in this discussion. The fact that we're doing it is significant in and of itself. 25 years ago, <clears throat> when I wrote the law, it later became known as the Leahy Law, not what I named, <laughs> a key uh, Republican to show bipartisanship, named it that. I don't think it would, I didn't think it would attract so much attention both here and around the world. Back then, as you know, there, uh, there were provisions in the Foreign Assistance Act which 
cut off aid to countries where there is a, quote, consistent pattern of gross violations of human rights. <clears throat> but those laws, even though they're still in the book, have not been enforced, not by Democratic or Republican administrations. And since successive U.S. governments were financing military death squads in Latin America, they routinely captured and tortured and killed critics of the government, whether members of the opposition, political parties or journalists, social <coughs> activists, academics, or priests. Latin America was not an aberration. The security forces of many countries, including some of our allies and partners and UN peacekeepers have long committed abuses with impunity. The Leahy Law, and as you know, there's a State Department version. Michelle pointed out a Defense Department version is designed with two purposes in mind. To help prevent you, <coughs> excuse me, U.S. complicity in human rights abuses by foreign security forces, and to encourage accountability when abuses occur. Consider the alternative: providing guns, bullets, uniforms, and other equipment, paid for training by American taxpayers to foreign military and police forces who commit the worst crimes, even though their government's doing nothing about it or actively covering it up. Even critics of the Leahy Law acknowledge that's unacceptable. And ultimately, it plays back against the United States. But the challenge has always been, how do you apply the law to achieve what some may regard as competing or even incompatible national interests? but which I believe, having talked to people over the years, are complementary. If we rightly, and we do rightly, condemn ISIS for summarily executing prisoners, so we now are also condemn the Iraqi military, which we support, when its soldiers brutally torture prisoners. It is a crime when Islamic Jihad targets civilians. But shouldn't it be when Egyptian soldiers shoot unarmed civilians? These are the questions we have, we have to ask. But I think the answer is obvious. When we partner with foreign security forces, we automatically become involved in the internal affairs of the country. The way those forces act and are perceived by their own people reflects either positively or negatively on us. When our partners, trained or equipped by us, commit abuses, we are complicit, or we're at least perceived to be complicit in the abusive acts that erode the legitimacy of those forces. And I think most people understand this. And to accomplish what we intend, the Leahy Law has been amended many times. One example is just two years ago, when I learned that the State Department was essentially not applying the law to governments that are among the largest recipients of U.S. military aid. We were providing weapons, ammunition, armored personnel carriers, other items in bulk, but we didn't know which units would receive them. And if you don't know which units are receiving the equipment, how do you know if they're eligible, as many are, or ineligible under the Leahy Law, as others are? I created a gaping loophole in the law. There are many other examples of different administrations that try to circumvent it or uh, subvert the application of the law. <coughs> Like when the term assistance was for years construed by the State and Defense Department to only mean training, not equipment. That was a clear violation of the intention of the law, and so it was necessary to amend it.
to make clear what never should be in doubt. Another example is defining which factors should be considered when determining whether information is credible for purposes of the law. For example, we learned of cases with the fact that a source of information, although credible, had been known to have been critical of U.S. policy. So we did not consider his information credible. Or instances when the fact the administration was not able to independently verify the information was the sole reason for rejecting it. Nowhere does the law say this. So we're amending it once again to clarify what should never have been in doubt. Because the Leahy Law intends to make clear the United States will not tolerate or support foreign partners who violate the personal integrity, dignity, or rights of their citizens. People order, commit, or cover up such crimes should be prosecuted and punished. Sometimes it's hard to state that strongly to uh, to another government. I know after the uh, killing of the clergy in El Salvador, they invited me down to show how they were in investigating. And part of the military explained to me how they were strongly investigating this. I said, well, there's a lot of blood in there. What about the, what kind of fingerprints and things do you find? But well, it was, it was such a mess, we, we cleaned that all up so it's not getting away. I said, I see. Now, automatic weapons were used and they eject shells. What about the, uh, the shell cases? Would you, well, uh, the military said they did take it and keep it safe. And have they been looked at? I uh, know they're locked up somewhere, somewhere. And it went on and on like that. <clears throat> and I said, you know, I prosecuted a lot of murder cases as a young state's attorney. If I had investigators come in and tell me this was the way they were investigating something, I would prosecute them as accessories. Um, that did not go over well. <laughs> and. Uh, when I came out to the car, we had Harvard car and security. Uh, I was told that from an intercept that the military command was unhappy with me and had a couple uh, cars filled with soldiers heading our way, and it might be wise for me to cut short my meetings. <laughs> Uh, we called our airplane, which was sitting at the airport, and I said as diplomatically as I could, we gotta get the hell out of here. <laughs> and uh, so we went zipping out, and there's the intersection in El Salvador, four-way four intersection, right by the defense ministry. We got there, and traffic was all jammed. There was a Sentinel looked about 14 years old, saying, guard outside the fence ministry. He starts walking toward us, taking his weapon off his shoulder. Our people jumped out and they're pointing automatic weapons at him. And I think, oh God, this is <laughs> not good. He made me think, so those of us who are old enough to remember the show, Hogan's Heroes. Mm -hmm. He looked at them, put them back on his shoulder, I see now they walked back to the wall and stood with his face to the wall. We left. We had similar uh, hesitation at the airport. Ended up driving right onto the uh, airfield, jumped in the plane. They started taxiing it out. When, uh, and pulling up the, the door as they started to move. We got the end of the runway, started driving up, all of a sudden, Engines were down. I had the earphones on. I asked, "What's going on?" He said, "They've ordered us not to take off." I said, "You got to follow that." He said, "Listen, 
countermanded, if the order was countermanded by somebody like you, <laughs> I said, yeah, boom, we're gone. Anyway, uh, but later, they invited me back to speak to their uh, military academy. And I brought the badge I had as a prosecutor. I said, we call this a shield. And when you wear a badge, it's not just to shield you. It's to shield the people you're supposed to protect. And we talked about that. And I hope it, some of that comes in. Because if local justice systems are slow or inefficient, they should not receive our support. The law requires when a foreign government rejects the need to hold perpetrators accountable, it should be withheld. But that's not the result we want. We want to help build professional and discipline uh, people as we do with some of uh, our State Department and Defense Department people are there. That's why I went back to the same country that had, had people heading out probably do me harm to go back and, and tell them, here's what your shield means. It's not just to shield you, it's to shield everybody around you. So we can't treat them as being above the law, as we've often done, but give them an incentive to obey the law, be accountable to it. We need military partners who are both capable and accountable, who respect the rule of law, defend the rights of citizens, build stability in their country. It helps their country, it helps us. That's why Leahy Law is not in conflict with the strategic security goal of building partner capacity. On the contrary, it represents a convergence of our respect for human rights and the rule of law and other national security interests. I still think back so much of my time as a prosecutor and I think we're going to have partners who are in countries where there's extrajudicial killings, torture, rape, forced disappearance. These are crimes in virtually every country where well, they need to demonstrate the perpetrators will be punished. Oftentimes it requires fundamental reforms of their judicial procedures. That takes time. We don't have unrealistic expectations for countries where the judicial system barely functions, but we are hoping to, for the political will to stop impunity, provide the right incentives, and to show that when American aid is there, we don't have a situation where the country the people of the country can blame us for what's being done with impunity by their country. <coughs> Disciplinary procedures, credible justice systems, distinguish professional soldiers and police from criminals. Accountability builds a public trust. That's why Alayi Law emphasizes remediation. U.S. officials, civilian and military in Washington, the embassies, and the combatant commands should look for opportunities to assist their foreign partners in remediating units of security forces that violate human rights. Unfortunately, there's another area where, for the most part, successful U.S. administrations, both parties, have failed to apply the Leahy laws intended. With rare exceptions, if a unit is deemed ineligible under the law, that's the end of the discussion. The foreign government may never be told why. There's rarely been the sustained effort we need to encourage accountability or to assist in that process, even though the law specifically requires the Secretary of State to assist governments in taking such steps. The law requires active diplomacy, and I've talked to our diplomats all over the world about this. Some encourage the idea, some do not. But civilian 
and military officials, I feel, the foreign post should discuss with their partners when and why units have been deemed ineligible through the vetting process and why the money is being held back. These are not easy conversations. I've actually been in some of them. And they can be pretty heated. But oftentimes, the more heated they are, the more understanding there is, and the better the results are. Now, I'm, I'm going to, as Wendy said, I'm going to be retiring in a few months to the relief of Marcel and my family, <laughs> our family. But the Leahy Law is one of the things I'm proudest of. I know too well that laws are only words of, on paper. But what really matters is how they're interpreted and enforced. We have the occasional naysayer who wants to waive the lady law or make exceptions to the facts are not supported, who think, well, this ally, for whatever reason, should be above and beyond reproach. But yet, I talk to so many wonderful people in our State Department and Department of Defense who know that the law is less about making accusations than about defending human rights wherever they're violated and building lasting partnerships that we can be proud of. A quarter of a century later, and thanks in part to many of you here, people who just worked so hard for our State Department and our Defense Department, the law is being applied far more effectively today than in the early years after I wrote it. But it remains a work in progress. In your discussions, you should uh, be free to say what you might like about it or what you don't like about it. But one issue that I hope you'll consider is whether and how to extend the Leahy Law, either in statute or as a matter of policy, to units of foreign security forces that purchase trading and equipment from the United States, not just those who receive grant assistance, but those who come in and pay for their trading or equipment. There is no logical reason why the same human rights standards should not apply, whether a foreign government pays for it or U.S. taxpayers pay for it. It reflects back on the United States. So I'm confident that the Leahy Law is here to say, stay. More and more people are recognizing that it's not designed to point fingers, but it's designed to build partnerships that are consistent with our values and our goals. And they recognize that the alternative is indefensible, so supporting abusive security forces that commit atrocities with impunity. That's not acceptable to the American people. I ask anybody in this country, no matter what their political background is. And it's not acceptable to the people in the countries where their police and their soldiers have a duty to protect them. And it shouldn't be acceptable to our partners. So thank you for letting me be here. I am proud of everybody who enforces it. I want it to continue because I think it will be in the best interest of our country, but especially it will be in the best interest of the people in countries <clears throat> where human rights are not respected. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Deputy Secretary Sherman, for being with us. I think, so at this stage, if uh, we're going to have the Leahy vetters, uh, I think, step outside for a moment. We'll have a short break now before the first panel starts. Uh, and if others can just stay in the room, we'll just be a few minutes. Thank you again. Yeah,